Informal fallacies, part three, weak inductive argument fallacies. Many types of weak inductive arguments have to do with generalizations. A generalization is a claim about the properties of a class set or group of things. For example, all bears in the San Gabriel Valley have brown fur. As, as this example shows, there's nothing inherently wrong with making a generalization. Much of our knowledge is built on generalizations. For example, all water molecules have one oxygen and two hydrogen. All mammals are vertebrates, etc. So we, we really need generalizations in order to create significant knowledge about the world. However, it's easy to go wrong when trying to prove a generalization or when reasoning from a generalization. So we're going to discuss some of the ways in which that happens. One mistaken type of reasoning with generalizations is called the fallacy of accident or rigid application of a generalization. The more usual name for this fallacy is the fallacy of accident, which is shorter but the textbook's name, Rigid Application of a Generalization, does describe more accurately what error this fallacy commits. This is an argument that applies a generalization or a rule or principle outside of its intended scope. So the generalization might be true or the rule might be correct. However, it's only supposed to apply within a certain domain or context. Here's an example. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Therefore, according to the Bible, it's wrong to kill animals. Now, this is from the Ten Commandments given to uh, Moses on Mount Sinai. However, it's pretty clear from the context that this commandment is only supposed to apply to people. Um, I mean, one reason for that is other parts of the Bible tell the ancient Jews to sacrifice animals as part of their worship of God. Um, that's not a modern practice of uh, Jews or Christians, but it was an ancient practice of Jews. So that's internal textual evidence for the likely intended scope of that claim. Now keep in mind, the fact that this argument is a fallacy does not prove the conclusion is false. Maybe it really is wrong to kill animals, but it's not wrong to kill animals for this reason. This is a rule that even if it's valid, is supposed to apply to humans only. Hasty generalization is an argument that relies on a small sample, i.e. too few examples that are unlikely to represent the whole group or population that a generalization is supposed to apply to. Here's an example. I know two guys in a fraternity who are both misogynistic jerks. Therefore, all fraternity members are misogynistic jerks. Now, just because you have a small sample of two guys who are misogynistic jerks, now, this does increase the probability of the conclusion. You know, two examples are better than no examples. However, this is still too small of a sample to be reasonably sure the conclusion is true. Also, another difficult thing about this particular generalization, all fraternity members are misogynistic jerks, is that it can be difficult to make universal generalizations about people. People like other organisms or complex systems have a lot of variability. Now, this is not to say that you should never make a universal generalization about people. A universal generalization is a generalization of the form all X's are Y's. There are many true universal generalizations about all people. For example, all people are animals. All people are mammals. All people are hominids. All people are vertebrates, etc. But when you get to subclasses of humans, especially those who belong to certain social groups, that's when the initial plausibility of a universal generalization is going to be low because there tends to be variability. Now, it could be true that a majority or a disproportionate amount of fraternity members are misogynistic. You'd have to define misogyny and then test it. And that would be an interesting thing to discover. However, um, because the claim itself is a universal generalization, it's going to be very hard to prove to begin with. And when you only have two examples, it's clearly a hasty generalization fallacy. Inductive generalization is the type of argument where you conclude something is true of a sample, so it therefore must be true of the entire population. Inductive generalization is not a fallacy. It's a type of inductive reasoning. 
The reason why I'm bringing it up here is because understanding this type of inductive reasoning is key to understanding the various types of fallacies involving it, the various ways it can go wrong. So when we're defining inductive generalization, we use the concepts from statistics of a sample and a population. A population is the set or group of things you're generalizing about. The sample is the subset or part of the population you've examined the properties of. And when you do inductive generalization, you're concluding that because the sample has this pattern of properties, therefore the whole population does as well. As a reminder, the word population, even though it comes from a Latin word meaning people, um, does not refer only to groups of people. A statistical population is any group of things. So we could talk about the population of atoms in the universe, for example. So an example of this is all bears in the San Gabriel Mountains have brown fur, therefore all bears have brown fur. So in this case, we might have a fairly large number of examples. We could have dozens, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of bears we've gathered data from over the decades. So this, might, this type of argument might avoid the hasty generalization fallacy, but that's not the only way an inductive generalization argument can go wrong. If we have a sample that is biased, i.e. not representative of the whole population, it could also be a fallacy for that reason. In this case, our sample is biased because we're only looking at bears in one particular part of the world. It ignores the fact that there's bears all over the world and they're going to have different colors of fur. For example, polar bears in the Arctic. Fallacy of composition involves reasoning about parts and wholes. Reasoning about parts and wholes is similar to reasoning about samples and populations. The difference is that a population is generally conceived of as a group of multiple individuals, whereas a whole can be one individual thing, object, or entity. The fallacy of composition argues that because a part of an object has a property, therefore the whole object has that property. Example, I used only the best ingredients to make this cake, therefore this cake is the best. Maybe I did use the best flour, sugar, eggs, etc., but it doesn't guarantee that I mix them together and otherwise bake them in the right way. Maybe I even forgot to add one of the ingredients. So this is a classic fallacy of composition. Fallacy of division is the converse of fallacy of composition, i.e. we reverse the order of the whole part relation. Fallacy of division argues that because a whole object has a property, Therefore, its part has the property. Example, she is very intelligent, so she must have very smart neurons. So intelligence is a property of her whole brain, you might say, or her whole nervous system. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the individual parts of the nervous system have the property of intelligence. If you're confused and can't remember composition versus division, think that division divides the whole into its parts. So you're starting from the property of the whole and then reasoning to a property of the part, which is a fallacy. A bias sample fallacy uses an unrepresentative sample or examples to support a claim about an entire population. Example, all members of the PCC honors program have a GPA of 3.2 or higher. Therefore, all PCC students have a GPA of 3.2 or higher. Looking only at PCC students in the honors program to calculate the average GPA of all PCC students is a very biased sample because in order to get into the honors program, you have to have a GPA of 3.2 or higher. Another example of the biased sample fallacy is the one about bears and the color of their fur. If you only look in the San Gabriel Valley or one part of the world, it's going to be a highly biased sample just in terms of geography. Representative samples are samples that are not biased, i.e. the pattern of properties of the sample do match those of the whole population, and that's just the opposite of a biased sample. Example, all of the PCC students in this classroom are under 7 feet tall, therefore all PCC students are under 7 feet tall. There's no particular reason to believe that these, this group of students is biased towards shortness. So they're probably a representative sample of the student population as a whole. A false cause fallacy is a general name for arguments that attribute causation without sufficient evidence. 
So false cause can be used to label an argument, but it's a highly generic fallacy term that has several specific types. Causation is a relation between two factors such that one, the cause, is the reason why or the explanation for the other factor, the effect. Example, smoking causes lung cancer. If you make that claim, you're saying that engaging in smoking is the explanation or part of the explanation for why someone gets lung cancer. Abduction is a type of inductive reasoning that attempts to prove that one factor is the cause of another. The post hoc fallacy is short for post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after which, therefore because of which. This is an argument that says because one factor occurs before another, it must have been the cause of the other. Example, I saw a black cat before taking the exam, and then I got an F. Black cats are bad luck. So sometimes when one event comes before the other, the first is the cause of the other, but not always. So if you assume without additional or sufficient evidence that the first event or factor is the cause, that's the post hoc fallacy. Let's discuss the difference between correlation and causation. A correlation is a relation between two factors such that if you know the value of one, you can use that to help predict the value of the other. Now, just because you know the value of one and there's a real correlation doesn't mean you can predict the value of the other completely. There may be additional factors as well. But as long as the value of one factor gives you some information about the likely value of the other, it still counts as a correlation. Example, the wealthier a country is, the more KFC restaurants it has. So I believe this correlation is true. Notice, however, that having a KFC restaurant is not a cause of wealth. If you concluded that, well, to become wealthy as a nation, you just need to build KFC restaurants, this would be a false cause fallacy. In fact, it's a reverse direction of causation. Probably the wealthier a country is, the more it can afford to have KFC restaurants. Uh, restaurants like this are basically a way for families to use some of their additional disposable income as the country becomes wealthier. Um, even though it's a lower end restaurant, the fact that people can afford to eat there often for convenience means that they have to have a certain amount of wealth. In contrast to correlation, causation is a relation between two factors such that one, the cause, is the reason why the other occurs. Now, every causation also has a correlation. The only way that one event can be the cause of the others is if there is indeed a correlation between them. However, the fact that there's a correlation is a necessary condition for there being a causal relationship, but not a sufficient condition. This means that all causations are correlations, but not all correlations are causation. There's also the concept of a trend. A trend is a temporary relation between two factors, which may um, not be an actual correlation or causation. Example, the blackjack dealer won the last three hands with the perfect 21. Now maybe the dealer is cheating, maybe the deck is loaded or biased in some way, or maybe it's just a temporary trend and there's no real correlation between this dealer or that deck, etc., and the hands that they're getting. Let's talk in more detail about the types of causal relations that can occur with correlations. Now, none of these types of relations have anything to do necessarily with fallacies. The thing is, in order to spot false cause fallacies more effectively, you need to understand how to reason carefully about correlations and causations. Otherwise, you won't realize when a fallacy about causation is being committed. So to begin, let's assume there's a correlation between two factors, X and Y. Example, putting suntan lotion on is correlated with getting a tan. So there's a correlation between having the lotion on and getting the tan. The thing is, there's many possible causal relationships between these two observed factors that there's a correlation for. One possible relationship is that the correlation is coincidental. That is, putting lotion on does not cause a tan, 
and getting a tan does not cause putting lotion on. Another possibility is that X causes Y. The first factor causes the second. In this case, it's putting lotion on causes getting a tan. Another possibility is reverse causation. That means Y causes X. It's the second cause that causes the first. Getting a tan causes putting lotion on. And a fourth possibility is common cause. That is, neither X nor Y explain the correlation. Instead, the correlation is explained by a third factor, Z. In this example, it could be sun exposure causes both people to put lotion on and causes them to get a tan. And in fact, this is what's probably happening with the suntan lotion and getting a tan correlation. There are also other possible causal relations to explain correlations. The other ones fall under the general category of multiple causes or complex causal systems. For example, ones with causal feedback loops, dynamic or nonlinear systems. So now let's talk about the common cause fallacy. This is a common fallacy when reasoning about causes. A common cause fallacy argument assumes that one factor causes another just because they're correlated, when in fact, both are the result of another cause that it, they share in common. And we can use the example from the last slide to illustrate this. Every time she puts the lotion on, she gets a tan. That lotion must darken your skin. In fact, the lotion is protecting the skin. But what's going on is she's putting the lotion on because she knows she's going to get sun exposure. So the fact that she's going to get sun exposure both causes her to put lotion on and causes her to eventually get a tan. So let's talk about some of the types of causation. The word cause is actually ambiguous. It can refer to many different types of relation between things. There's a whole complex sub-discipline within philosophy and within science about the nature of causation. And this is something that philosophers and scientists still sort of debate about, like what's the best way or what are the several ways to understand causation? We're gonna go through the various ways the term cause can be used and talk about the most common ways. So let's look as an example at the case of smoking causing lung cancer. When someone claims that smoking causes lung cancer, what do they mean? One possible type of causation is the cause as a necessary condition for the effect. That means that if you get lung cancer, then you smoke. So getting um, lung cancer only occurs if you smoke. That is, smoking is a necessary condition for getting lung cancer. Well, this may be true in some cases of causation, but it's not true in this case. So we know that there are other causes of lung cancer other than smoking. And people who claim that smoking causes lung cancer don't claim it's the only cause of lung cancer. So if you're asserting something as a necessary condition, you're saying it's the only reason why something happens. Conversely, there's the concept of sufficient condition, which switches the order of the if-then clauses. So if someone is interpreting uh, smoking as a sufficient condition for getting lung cancer, this means that if you smoke, then you get lung cancer. In fact, this is not what people generally mean when they say smoking causes lung cancer. There could be some types of cause that work in this way, but smoking doesn't guarantee you will get lung cancer. It just makes it more probable. A third type of potential causal relation is both necessary and sufficient condition. This means, uh, that this would mean in this case, you get lung cancer if and only if you smoke. Now, once again, there can be causes that work in this way where the cause is both necessary and sufficient condition for the effect. The effect is only and always produced by that one cause. But um, this is not the case because as we know, smoking is neither necessary nor sufficient for getting lung cancer. So it cannot be both if it's neither. Fourthly, we can think of a cause as a partly jointly sufficient condition. Joint sufficiency means that multiple factors go into producing something. In the context of causation, there would be multiple causes working together to produce an effect. This is not the only type of causation we see in the world, 
but it's common in complex systems like human bodies where you have multiple factors interacting all at once all over the place. So this would mean in the case of smoking that if you smoke and have other factors present, such as perhaps certain genes and other environmental factors, then you get lung cancer. And in this particular case, smoking and lung cancer, the most reasonable way to interpret the causal claim is indeed as number four. Smoking is a partly jointly sufficient condition for getting lung cancer. Now let's look at another type of fallacy involving generalizations, the slippery slope fallacy. This is reasoning that a small initial event or state of affairs will inevitably cascade into a large extreme event or state of affairs. Example, if we allow the police to use closed circuit TV cameras for surveillance, then we will inevitably usher in an era of totalitarian government in which all privacy is lost under the watchful eye of Big Brother. Now, one thing about slippery slope fallacies is that arguments which commit this fallacy can have some kind of sensible point behind them. Perhaps if we allow the police to use um, closed circuit TV cameras for surveillance in a widespread manner, this will make the probability of a totalitarian government with no privacy higher. However, it does not mean it makes the probability of that possibility above 50% or in other words, significantly high. So it's still going to be a logically weak argument. Also keep in mind that there are some actual, what you could call slippery slopes or chain reactions in the real world. So one example is the chain reaction that occurs in an atomic bomb, a fission bomb specifically. When you have um, uranium and you create an initial explosion in the atomic bomb that has uranium in it, that initial explosion is enough to make some of the uranium atoms basically uh, bump into, cascade into others. And once that happens, it increases the fission, the atomic fission of those uranium atoms. They start splitting. And when they split, that causes more uranium to split, etc. And each time one uranium atom splits, you get a release of energy. So this is an, a real life example of what you could call a slippery slope, a snowball, or a chain reaction. They do happen. The slippery slope fallacy is asserting such a chain reaction will occur when in fact there is not sufficient grounds for it to for you to believe that so it's unreasonably or without justification asserting that there will be this slippery slope now let's look at some sample problems where we have to identify the fallacy committed by an argument that ambulance didn't even stop for the red light it went zooming right through and the police didn't give the driver a citation our criminal justice system is unbelievably corrupt this is the fallacy of accident or rigid application of a generalization. Even though in general, it's a valid rule to give a driver a citation if they're speeding, this doesn't apply to ambulances or other emergency vehicles. Another sample problem. I kissed my wife before going to the track and then I won big. Therefore, kissing my wife caused me to win at the track. This is a post hoc fallacy or post hoc ergo propter hoc. Just because the one event of kissing happened before the other, winning big after betting on horses at the track, does not prove that the first event caused the second. It may have just been a coincidence. This Starbucks drink tastes good. Therefore, everything at Starbucks tastes good. This is a hasty generalization fallacy because there's only one example being used to support the generalization. One example is almost always too few. Um, so in this case, it's one out of dozens or hundreds of products served by Starbucks. So it's definitely too small of a sample. If we give the federal government the power to require background checks before purchasing firearms, then this will only end with the complete abolition of the right to bear arms. This is a slippery slope fallacy. Even if it's true that giving the government one power to regulate 
gun ownership makes it more likely for the complete abolition of the right to bear arms, um, it doesn't really increase the probability by that much since it's a lot, it's a much different policy. So this definitely commits the slippery slope fallacy. Corporations are composed of individual humans. Individual humans are morally responsible for their actions. Therefore, corporations are morally responsible for their actions. This is the fallacy of composition, reasoning that because a part has some property, therefore the whole does. You can see in this case, the corporation is a group of individuals, but instead of regarding this as hasty generalization, fallacy of composition is more appropriate. How do you know when to use each one? Well, in this case, a fallacy of composition is looking typically at the properties of one part. You're not trying to get a representative sample of parts then to re and then reasoning based on that to a whole group. Also, there's a difference between a collective entity like a corporation and just any old group, set, or class of things. A collective entity like a corporation has some ability to act collectively. Oftentimes there's rules, hierarchies of authority, etc., that create a kind of cohesive identity and criteria for collective action that you don't get in mere groups or assemblages. So for this reason, we can treat corporations as if they were single objects that have parts and holes. Interestingly, it is an object of serious debate whether corporations are morally responsible for their actions in a way that's similar to that of individuals. However, even if the conclusion of this argument is true, the argument form is still a fallacy. The average height of NBA players is six feet, seven inches. Therefore, the average height of humans is six feet, seven inches. This is a biased sample fallacy because NBA players tend to be much taller on average because that gives an advantage when playing basketball. Planet Earth is over 4 billion years old. Humans are part of planet Earth. Therefore, humans are over 4 billion years old. This is a fallacy of division. It's reasoning from a property of the whole, planet Earth, to a property of the part, humans. Next up, part four, fallacies of unwarranted assumption and diversion. 